Apostle Paul to the leader of a house church, Philemon, around 60 AD. Philemon was wronged by his slave Onesimus, who fled to Paul's prison to seek help, and in the process, came to faith in Jesus. In his letter, Paul asked Philemon to forgive Onesimus, accepting him back in a relationship as a brother in Christ. Paul points to the equal standing Jesus' followers share as beneficiaries of God's grace. But for Paul, partnership is not just an idea. It is to be acted out in relationship. Paul asks Philemon to receive back Onesimus not just as a brother in Christ, but as if he were Paul himself. In addition, Paul commits to paying any debts accrued by Onesimus. Paul's letter to Philemon is saturated with gospel-motivated action. In advocating for reconciliation with Onesimus, Paul is pointing to God's reconciliation of the world through Jesus, who took on humanity's sin, absorbing the consequence onto himself. As co-heirs of grace through Jesus, we can work through our broken relationships with grace and forgiveness because we first received the ultimate forgiveness through Jesus on the cross. Bodies here in the sanctuary, as well as we fellowship together. A lot of you online are listening, maybe at this time or maybe sometime later. But I want to remind you, in case you forgot, that this is the first Sunday of the month, and it is our tradition on the first Sunday of the month to share in the Lord's Supper together. I have a little piece of bread up here and some juice, and maybe you could take this moment as we get started here today to. Uh, do the same at home to find some kind of liquid and also a piece of bread that you might want to share with your family as well and or, or just share with us in Konania, a word that is found twice in the book of Philemon, but uh, means sharing and fellowship together. And over the airwaves or on the internet, however it works, that we can fellowship together in the name of Jesus Christ and uh, share in what he's done for us forgiven our sins and offers us a new life. Well, as you are aware, this morning we're going to be looking into the book of Philemon. This is an unusual book that we find. We haven't found one like this through our journey through the scriptures at all thus far. We're going to find two more somewhat similar to it um, later in the next couple of weeks as we look into 2 John and 3 John. But this book is unique in itself is that it is written to an individual about another individual. And it's not instruction for directly, as Paul does in other books, that we need to do this for elders and this is how the church should act and all these kind of things. It's about a single relationship between two men. As a, and how, but relationships is what the church is about. Relationships is about what God and us and other people as well. And so it's an important book for us to look into and to think about. And there are two words in this book that I want us to remember this morning and to think about as well as walk through this message here this morning. So Philemon uh, is about this man in this in this who this book is written to, but I want you to know that it has an, a somewhat of a different beginning as well. Because in this book, as we read the first three verses, we're going to find some other people mentioned. We're going to find a woman by the name of Aphia. She is believed to be uh, possibly Philemon's wife. And then another person by the name of Agrippas. And uh, he may be his son, some believe. But then we're going to see also it mentions a house church. Now, what happens here is just like in your small groups, if you're part of a small group, that when you're in a smaller group, there is more intimacy. There's more sharing. We hear about maybe somebody's problems. We hear about family issues. We hear about parents. We might hear about work issues and all kinds of things. And they're relational issues often. And in this book this morning, it, it, we look into it, and that's what we're going to hear about. 
a relational issue that probably the rest of this small house church knew about. And so let's read the first couple um, verses here. It says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Agrippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Now, I want you to know also today that I am reading this from the ESV, and I know a lot of you use the NIV, and you'll find that they're very much similar. But if you're on a digital device and you want to follow along exactly what I'm reading, you can just go up to the top or whatever and flip it over to the ESV if you would like. Paul finishes this and he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And from this point on in this letter, Paul is only addressing one person. He's addressing Philemon, who has an issue with another person. And his name is Onesimus. And uh, so Paul wants to address this, and it really applies to us because we all are in relationships with people as well and as we walk through life. Now, so there are three people involved in the rest of this letter, Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. And I don't need to tell you about Paul. Paul, the great apostle, the great missionary, and uh, he was just a remarkable man in his uh, desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The second person is Philemon, and if I were to ask who knows something about him, we probably would find ourselves really trying to grasp at something. Who is this man, Philemon, that Paul wrote to and who this letter is addressed to? Well, we believe that he was probably a somewhat well-to-do Roman citizen, Um, He lived possibly in Colossae and uh, was there, and uh, he became a believer in Jesus Christ. But from what I understand, Paul, and what we understand is that Paul never went to Colossae. He went to Ephesus. We know that. He wrote a book to them, but he also wrote one to the Colossian church. But he went to Ephesus, and he spent time there. And so it's kind of believed that as those two cities were somewhat close to each other, that this man, Philemon, probably met Christ in Ephesus. And uh, that's where Paul discipled him and where Paul got to know him. And maybe when Paul left, he went back and he established this house church back in his home. And other people were starting to come to know Jesus Christ. Well, in his family, I mentioned there, and those who attended his house church, there was also another person in that household, and his name was Onesimus, and we're going to talk about him in a few moments. But Paul addresses Philemon, and Paul, when I read this, I really thought, man, if Paul were to write me a letter, this would be a great thing that if he could say that about me, what he says about this man here. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayer. So this is somebody that Paul remembered in prayer. Because if I hear, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and all the saints. But I thought about that. What's he saying? He's saying this is a man that in his heart is carrying out the great commandment, loving God above all things and loving his neighbors, and caring about them. And he says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. And then this last comment he makes, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. Paul is saying that you, Philemon, you bring me joy. You bring me comfort for the love that you show to God and the love that you show to other people. So Paul knew this man and he knew of his heart and he was concerned for him as well. He says, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed in you. And I trust this morning as I share this message that maybe our hearts would be a little refreshed in the Lord too, that we would look at ourselves and maybe 
take these two words that I'm going to share with you today and say, look at ourselves about them as well. So as Paul goes on and he continues here, we see that he continues to share. And uh, let's go on. He says, accordingly, and that connects to what he just said. He said, I want to ask you to do something here. And he's going to ask him to do something very personal in his relationship. He says, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. He's saying, I could tell you, you have to do this. But he, what he's saying to him, though, I really want it to come from your heart. I want you to decide you want to do it, not that you're commanded to do it. And he says, and, and um, required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ. I appeal to you. Now, Paul reiterates this twice. He says, I'm appealing to you. I'm asking you. Some of the translations use the word, I beseech you to do the right thing. I'm imploring you to do this. I'm not going to command you to do it. And he says, to do this thing. Now, I mentioned this morning that earlier in the week, uh, Pastor Chris called me and he said, would you be willing to preach? I was going to do Philemon. Of course, certainly can't do that. And are you willing, would you be willing to step in and help, help out here? And uh, so um, I, I told him, okay, you know, be willing to do that. Got back with him, told him I wanted to pray about it, got back with him. And then I started reading this book. And as I read through this book, I thought maybe this is why he asked me. Because Paul said, I, Paul, an old man, you know, that um, he was saying, I'm old. I'm going to tell you to do something. And then I thought, well, how many times in the New Testament do we find that phrase, old man? And only one other time. And it referred to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who was an old man. And so maybe an old man is talking to you today as well, you know, that to share a thought with you. And Paul said, an old man. Now a prisoner, and he was under arrest. He was in Rome when he wrote this. He said, whose father I became in my imprisonment. I want to read verse 10 again. He said, I appeal to you for my child. In other words, and then he names him Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Another kind of humorous thing that I read this week, I was reading other versions, and I read the paraphrase, the message, and uh, the way that Eugene Peterson put it in the message, he said, while in prison, I fathered a child. And uh, made me stop. I said, what? <laughs> you know? And uh, what is Paul saying? And then he said, they said, of course, Onesimus, my son. And, and what he's saying is that, hey, Onesimus came to me while I was in prison. And uh, I led him to Jesus Christ. He came to know Jesus Christ. He's my spiritual son. And I care about him very much. So who is this man, Onesimus? Often in the New Testament, in many versions, we might read or we might see a footnote when it uses the word slave or servant. And it, you look down in the footnotes and it says bond servant. And there's a difference between being a slave and a bond servant. Because a bond servant was someone who was in servitude for a period of time. And in the Roman Empire, a bond servant was someone who was in servitude for seven years. And after the end of seven years, he was given his wage, given a right, a certificate saying he is a free person. Now, he may have gone into bondage because of debt or a lot of other things, but he was expected to carry out this for seven years. So Onesimus was a bond servant, but he did not fulfill his obligation. He ran away. And he just didn't run a short distance, because if you were to look on a map where Colossae is and look where Rome is, it's over a 1,000 miles as the crow flies. 
And uh, some, I read someone put that if you were to journey, it would be 1,200 miles to get there. So this was no short journey that this man ran away. And it, he definitely wronged Philemon. He didn't fulfill his obligation. And he definitely, and well, I shouldn't say definitely, some think that even by what Paul wrote a little later, later in the letter, that he um, may have taken some property or something that belongs to Paul when he left. And he finds his way somehow. I mean, it's really amazing when you think about it. He leaves that, travels a thousand miles, and finds Paul, who's under house arrest in Rome. And he meets Paul. Paul shares with him about Jesus, and he becomes a follower in Jesus Christ. And it's really, truly an amazing thing that happened there. But there are two words that I want to share with you this morning that if you could walk out of here with or you at home, you could take and think about. Think about your life and your walk with Jesus Christ with these two words as well. Because in the next verse, it tells us something about this man, Onesimus. It says in verse 11, he says, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Something happened because this man was useless and he became useful. And we already talked about what happened. He became a believer, a follower in Jesus Christ. And um, so Paul is now giving some instruction to Philemon about this man. But let's talk about Onesimus for a moment. A transformation happened in him. And that's one of the words I want to give you this morning is transformation, a change. The Bible and the New Testament is all about transformation. Jesus came to transform us. Jesus came to transform our eternity. Jesus came to transform the way that we live right now. And he called us to discipleship. It's about new beginnings. It's about new life. And when Paul, at one time, Paul was useless. He was a persecutor of those who followed Jesus Christ. But then he became useful. And he became one who was encouraging followers of Jesus Christ. At one time, probably Philemon was useless for the kingdom because he probably was all about himself and what he could get and greed and maybe serving the Roman gods. We don't know. But now he was intent in his heart to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He became useful in the kingdom of God. And as we think about that, Every one of us should be in that position. That one time in my life, I realized I was useless for the kingdom work. Now I'm useful being used by God. I know that in 1973, almost 50 years ago, I went to the Adirondack Mountains in New York, and that's where I received Christ as my Savior and Lord. Someone told me that I needed Jesus, just like this man went to Rome, and he was told. And I didn't know hardly anything. But God's Spirit began to dwell in me. I began to learn and to grow and to be transformed into being that person that he called me to be, and it should be that way. But I want you to know that this transformation is just not spiritual. It should affect the whole being of us, this transformation. This transformation starts as a spiritual thing, but it should affect our body and our soul, our mind, all of us in the way that we live. This transformation should change the way we think. It should change the way that we, the purpose that we might have for our life. Why am I living? What is my hope? What am I all about? It ought to change our worldview, how I see things happening in society today and the way things are going on around me. Change my worldview and the way I approach life. It ought to change the words that come out of my mouth. Because Paul says it should change us to the point where not even any coarse language comes out of our mouth. It's a transformation. 
that takes place. And it ought to change my behavior. You see, and my behavior is the constant sermon that I preach to others. People see me all the time. And what is the sermon that I'm preaching to them in my behavior? What is the sermon I'm preaching in my home? By my behavior to my wife, to my husband? What is the sermon I'm preaching to my children by the way I behave and act? What is the sermon I'm preaching to my neighbors? Or what is the sermon I'm preaching to my co-workers? Or in school, where I go to school? What is it? Because, see, people that you might not be sharing with your mouth, but they're watching and they're seeing. And they're seeing the way that you behave in life. When Paul prayed, he often prayed for the people of the church, this, this phrase, that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. What is he saying? That their behavior, the way that they live, would glorify God and worth, be worthy of the fact that they call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. In other places, he prayed that they would bear fruit in every good work. Well, what's our good work? It's our behavior, the things that we do in the way that we live. And so when we come to Jesus Christ, these things ought to be changed in our life. We shouldn't be matching up to society. We want to match the kingdom of God. We want to be the way that Jesus called us to live. And that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That I'm different. I'm new. I'm being changed. I'm being transformed in life. And I say that, that that should affect us in society. And when we consider our role and the fact that I call myself a Christian, can I look in the mirror and look at myself and say, I'm different than society because I'm being transformed as a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm a different creation now than I was before. You see, Jesus didn't call us just to pray a prayer. In fact, I, I I'm not sure I can find that any place where Jesus said, pray a prayer. He said, be my disciple. What's a disciple? Someone who follows their master. They walk in his footsteps. And this is the message that we bring as we walk in the footsteps. And see, Onesimus, he went from being useless to being a follower. He was going to be useful now in the kingdom of God. He was going to do what he didn't do, and he was going to make it right now in life. And that is a word that is so important for us to consider. Am I useful in the kingdom? And it doesn't matter if you have a dramatic late life conversion or you're raised in the church. Someplace along the line, we become a disciple one who walks in the ways of Jesus Christ. In Romans 12, 2, the apostle wrote, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will. You see, and what's he saying? That we shouldn't be in conformity to the world. That we should be transformed. We should be changed in the way we act, the way we live, in our thought process, and in, in our words, in our behavior, in our purpose, in our world view. And this transformation affected Onesimus. Now, we're not sure if the Holy Spirit just personally spoke to him and he said, you need to go back a thousand miles and make it right with Philemon. Or if the Apostle Holy Spirit spoke through the Apostle Paul when he told Philemon or told Paul his story, and Paul said, You know what? You need to make that right. You know, you're a transformed man. We, we don't know how that went about, 
But he was willing to travel a thousand miles to go back and make it right with Philemon. So let's talk about Philemon for a minute. And let's read what Paul said to him, beginning in verse 12. He said, I am sending him back to you, Onesimus, back to you, sending my very heart. I would, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. In other words, he's saying, hey, this guy's he's useful to me. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that you that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this purpose, for this perhaps, is why he has parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more then I say. And so he's saying to him, I want you to receive this man back, to have proper relationship with him. Well, what was necessary? So our first word was transformation. And this is what transformed hearts do. Because we are following Christ. We're following Jesus. And you know what we do? We have a willingness to forgive. And our second word this morning is forgiveness. I've, I wondered several times this week, I wonder what Philemon did when there was a knock on his door and he opened the door and there was Onesimus standing there. Been gone for a long, long time because I'll tell you what, he didn't get on a jet and just fly to Rome. It took a long journey to get there and then to take a long journey to come back. And here he was and he hands him this letter from Paul. Now, what he could have done is he could have talked done to uh, to uh, Onesimus like Roman society dictated. He could have had him beaten. He could have had him thrown in jail because he was a bond servant who fled. He didn't meet his obligation, and he could have been punished that way. But Paul was asking him to do something totally different, not to do that but to forgive him. Forgiveness is one of the great virtues of Christianity. It is one of the most freeing of gestures that we can do for ourselves and for another person. For when we forgive them, they are no longer in any bondage to us, but we also take ourselves out of jail because forgiveness, when we have an unforgiving spirit, we are locking ourselves up with hatred, with bitterness. We have all kinds of feelings that we shouldn't be having. And when we forgive somebody, that's destroyed. And even though when the Satan might bring it back to us, we say, oh, no, it's gone. You see, I have forgiven. And it's actually more freeing to you than it is to the other person when we truly forgive someone else. And Jesus said, this is what transformed people do. In the Lord's Prayer, what did he say? He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness. And of the five or six things mentioned in the Lord's Prayer that should be included in prayer, only one of them Jesus went back to. At the end of that prayer, after it was all done, in the next two verses, Jesus said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How important forgiveness is. In Matthew 18, Peter said, 
well, Lord, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70. And he wasn't saying that you take out some kind of device and count off 70 times and on 71, you don't need to forgive him anymore. He was saying, you do it continually. Even if they continue to have the same sin against you, you forgive because we're walking the path of Jesus Christ. A couple of quick things about forgiveness. What would have happened if Philemon said, thank you, Paul, for writing this to me, but I'm not going to forgive him. And he had Onesimus thrown in jail. Does that negate what Onesimus did? No, not at all. He did the right thing. He went back. He tried to bring healing in the relationship. And that's the same thing for us. Sometimes we ask people for forgiveness and they won't give it to us, but we've done the right thing. And the second thing is, in life, we often have to forgive those who do not ask for it. And so I truly believe a lot of times we're offended by people and they don't even know they offended us. You see, but we're to forgive them because and even though they don't ask for it, because I'm going to ask you something. If I'm a follower of Jesus, what did Jesus do? He forgave you before you ever asked to receive his forgiveness. He forgave you. And we just need to receive it in our life. So Paul challenges Philemon to forgive Onesimus. Now, we don't know how this thing played out. We don't know if he did or he didn't. I believe he probably did because of the way Paul writes about his heart. And I know that Onesimus, what Paul wrote, was a transformed person. And I think their relationship was transformed as well because they were now brothers in Jesus Christ. So we have these two words to consider this morning. Am I transformed? In other words, do I conform to the world or do I conform to the kingdom of Christ in the way that I act, my thought life, my behavior, the things that I do? Which one do I match up better with? And second word is forgiveness. Am I one who forgives? Or is there someone I need to go to and ask for forgiveness? Two big words for us in life. And they are two words that have to do with the Lord's Supper. Jesus came to this earth. He walked in this earth. He died to transform our future, heaven or hell. That's the event when we pray, but to transform us even today, to be his disciple, to walk in his way, to transform us. And he did that through his forgiveness for us. So I just want to ask you this morning, have you received Christ as your savior? Those of you who are listening you might be listening later in the week, but if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you know, the Bible says now is the day of salvation. You need to do that today. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I just implore you, get right with God. And I want to pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, you know when someone is going to listen to this. You know, Lord, if someone is listening right now, and they, Lord, know in their heart they're not a follower of Jesus. Or they may be trying on their own, but they've never surrendered to you, never received your forgiveness in their life, never been transformed. And I pray for them right now, Lord, that they at this moment would say yes to you. Yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. Yes, Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me. And I receive your forgiveness this very day. And I commit myself to be your follower, to walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. And if that's you today and you have prayed that prayer, I just ask that you would put it online. Be bold, be strong, put it out there. 
And secondly, if you're a believer today, and maybe you kind of slid back, you're not believing that transformed life. As you receive the Lord's Supper this morning, maybe you ought to listen to the words of Paul who said, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so God gives us opportunity to repent and to turn because he's a loving, forgiving God. So this morning, we're going to remind ourselves of what Jesus did because he said, do this in remembrance of me. And the Bible tells us on the night that Jesus, before Jesus died, he took bread and he broke it. Pick up your bread. Look at it. His body was broken for us. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. Thank you, Jesus, that you took your sin upon us. You took our sin, I should say, upon you. Lord, and Lord, you offer us a new beginning in life to be born again. The Bible tells us that after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new the New Testament, the new covenant, he said. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. He said, take and drink. Let us drink together. And Lord, thank you for the reminder. Thank you for giving us this simple act to remind ourselves of what you've done for us that we should do for others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we trust that you would have a good week this week, that you would serve the Lord in a transformed way, not conformed to the world, but transformed into the kingdom of God. May God's peace rest upon you as you leave. Amen.